Uh, it is good to be here tonight, uh, church family. Um, my name is Justin Schroeder. I have the joy of pastoring uh, Redeemer Bible Church in Elk Grove. So not too far away. Uh, some of our people work down in your neck of the woods. It's kind of how it goes, right? People move to Sacramento to work out here. Um, but it's good to be here. I have had the uh, joy of... Um, I've had the joy of knowing about this church for probably 15 or more years. Um, when Mike Sinelli was a Sac State student, he was at our church in our college ministry. So that was my first introduction to the Sinelli family. Um, I had the joy of going to Cornerstone Seminary. Um, and then I got to meet Pastor Tony in class. I'm kind of glad he's not here because preaching for your professor always gets weird. Um, so uh, I know you might hear me say that. So I, I wish you were here, brother. Um, so yeah, yeah, you can tell him. Yeah, yeah. No, just he's been a dear friend in uh, ministry and just really appreciated his heart for the word of God, for Christ and for people, as you all know, because he's your shepherd. Um, and so uh, about five years ago, the Lord moved me to where I'm at now. I was at a church in um, Fair Oaks, which is like near Folsom, other side of Sacramento. And, uh, and then God took me to Elk Grove. That was not my plan. I was going to go to Salt Lake City and plant churches. And then God's like, how about Elk Grove? And I was like, where's that? I didn't even know where it was. It's like the wide spot in the road when you're driving to L.A. Um, so but that's where God has me. And it's been great. God's doing a good work. And so I'm grateful to be there um, and to serve Christ there. And so... Uh, it is a joy to be here tonight uh, for your Body Life Conference and just hopefully encourage you from the Word, even as God encourages me from the Word. Um, it's always sobering to open the Word of God. Whenever somebody calls me and, and says, hey, you want to come preach at our church? My first thought is, why do you want me to do that? Um, and I mean that, right? Uh, I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said, it's kind of miraculous that God lets me preach once, but that anybody would come back again is truly amazing. Um, and, you know, so it's just, we obviously, it's the Word of God, Amen. Like, that's what, that's what speaks to our souls, and so it's a joy to open the Word and a, and a privilege to do that with you. Um, when Pastor Tony emailed me for the first time, he said, hey, we're, we're thinking about something on mission and missional living. Um, and so that was something that excites me because it's something God's been stirring in my soul and stirring in our church family, so it's kind of cool how God does that when, you know, it's like, hey, he's stirring us in one way, then somebody says, hey, come talk to us about this. It's like, all right, God, you must be telling me something, Right. Um, and so as we think about, you'll hear me say this a lot, missional living, um, or living on mission. And what we're really talking about is not something we do somewhere else in the world, but we do in our lives, in our communities. And so often for the American church, when we think about mission, uh, we go automatically to foreign cultures. And, and that's okay. We, we, we can do that. Praise God for that. Um, but I think one of the, one of the uh, deficiencies in that thinking is that we have, we've forgotten that mission actually is something we do here. Um, and again, that's so easy to say and so hard to do. And so we just want to unpack from the Gospel of John um, this idea of missional living. And so hopefully it'll benefit all of our souls as we do it together. Um, but I, in the spirit of full transparency, um, I feel really inadequate for this. Um, one, just because, you know, sometimes I feel tongue-tied. I feel like Moses, Lord, my tongue is not adequate, right? Um, and if you've ever taught the word, maybe you feel the same way. But when it comes to t the topic of living on mission, um, I seem to fail more than I succeed. I don't know if you feel that way. Um, I chicken out, and I'm not bold with the gospel like I should be. It's one of those areas I feel like a regular failure in. Um, for every great conversation I have about Jesus with an unbeliever, I think I've probably missed a thousand. Um, you know, sometimes I feel like I swing, and I swing for the stands, and I can't even hit the ball, right? I'm barely getting to first base. And so preparing for this time with y'all uh, has been painful for my soul, to be honest, because the Lord's just like hammering me. Um, he's been working me over and over. Um, and, but I'm, I'm hopeful, all right, saints? I'm hopeful uh, because when Jesus left this earth, he gave us this promise, right? All the authority has been given to me. It's a great promise. But then if you fast forward just a few sentences, he says, what? I'm with you always. Right, so this is not something that we're, it's not a pull yourself up by your bootstraps theology, right? Okay, do more better. Just let's get, let's get after this better. It's okay, Lord, all authority is yours and you promise to be with me. So we're gonna trust the promises of God, amen? Because that's what we do. We're faith people. We trust the promises of God and uh, we have confidence in Christ that even though we feel inferior to the task of living on mission, Christ is for us, he's in us, he's with us, right? So we have hope there. Um, but I also have hope for all of us in this because the Lord is faithful, right? And he's gracious. 
and he's patient, and he's doing this good work of what I like to call gospel-empowered transformation. Are you, if you've been a child of God for, let's say, five years, are you the same person today you were five years ago? If you've been a child of God 20 years, are you the same one today that you were 20 years ago? Hopefully the answer is no. Right? If, you, if you've maintained spiritual infancy, that's not good. That's not what God's good plan for your life is. All right, His good plan for your life is spiritual maturity. And so I'm hopeful um, because this God who has begun a good work in us, he's going to keep doing it. He's going to keep doing this good work in each of us through the powerful working of the Holy Spirit as the word of God is proclaimed. And we know that. So this is an area that I actually find great comfort there because I can feel like, Lord, Am I ever going to grow in in speaking your name better to those who don't know you? And the answer is yes. If you live the life of faith, if you live in submission to the Lord and his will, if you live in in walking in his ways, you'll grow. Just like there might have been another area you thought, oh, I'm never going to overcome this battle with anger or with whatever. God and God's grown you. So here's an area, God can grow us. We're not in a stalemate till we get to eternity in this area of our faith. Um, And so as we become more like Christ... God will be faithful, and he'll energize us and transform us in this area to actually glorify him, to speak of him wherever he plays, places us. Um, so as we begin our time together, uh, we're going to do something a little different. Um, I'm compelled to spend a little bit of time in prayer. I know, Chris, you already prayed, but we're going to pray a little bit more. Uh, because we believe in a God who does mighty things, don't we? All right, we, we do believe in that. Um, if you're born again, he's done mighty things in you, right? You were dead in your sins. You were lost in your transgressions. You were hard-hearted, and he spoke light into your soul. And you've been given a new heart, right? God has already begun to, already done a mighty work in you. Uh, I love the way one writer says it. God just turned your lights on. They were off for a long time. God flipped the switch. He did mighty things. 2 Corinthians 4, he spoke light into your soul. Um, And then the mighty things that God continues to do is he's making us more like Christ. He's chiseling away the rough edges. He's hacking off carnality. He's polishing blemishes. These are the mighty works of God, right? I think sometimes we think of mighty works of God and we go straight to like miracle stuff. But the mighty works of God is he saved you and he's sanctifying you. It's his mighty works. And and yet we want him to keep doing mighty works in us, but we also want him to do mighty works through us, don't we? Jesus literally said, you'll do greater works than these. I mean, I don't think we believe that, honestly. Like, I don't know about that. Jesus was pretty cool. He did pretty great things. I've never done that. What was his point? You're going to open the eyes of the nations to the gospel. You're, the gospel will go to all the world. Mightier things will happen as you submit to me. So God wants to do mighty works in and through his people. And we should believe that, church. We should believe that with all of our hearts. It's the promises of God. And so this gospel that is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes that all those who are lost in their sins and unrepentant, he is eager and willing to take from darkness into his marvelous light as they repent and believe. So these are God's mighty works. Um, And the reason I'm rehearsing that with you is that sermons on mission won't cut it. We need God to do mighty works. Now we know he uses his word, correct? He uses his word, but we need his help to do these mighty works. And so I want to begin this time kind of on our knees together. And what we're going to do is spend a few minutes just praying with those around you, all right? I know we're just going to hear this this sermon tonight and a few more tomorrow, but I'm burdened that God would do a good work in us and then through us, right? So go ahead, grab the people around you. I know this is a little awkward. It feels maybe charismatic, but go ahead. It's all right. (laughs) Grab people around you. And I'm going to prompt you to pray for three things, all right? And I'll give you a minute or two to pray for each one. So don't be shy. You're brothers and sisters in Christ. You all know each other. So we're going to pray for a few things as we begin. One, the first thing is we're going to do, we're just going to, we're going to say, Father, thank you for doing a mighty gospel work in us when you saved us, all right? So just thank God for the mighty work of the gospel he's already done in your life by saving you, all right? Go. Spend time thanking God for his mighty work of saving you.
Hmm. All right, next, next prompt is, Father, we just want to thank you for your mighty works that we're no longer who we once were, that you're doing a mighty work of sanctifying us, and maybe even pray specifically and thank God for the things that you know that you used to be a certain way, but he has done mighty works and you are no longer what you used to be as God has, has made you more like Christ. And lastly, just thank, let's, let's ask God, so they plead with the Lord that he might use this time to bring us to a place where we would better take his gospel to our neighbors, co-workers, and our community. All right, I'm going to pray for us. Father God, we, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we are thankful. We're thankful that we are not what we once were. Father, every one of us in this room, we at one time were lost in our transgressions and sins. We were hostile to God, alien, alienated from you. Sinners by birth and by choice. And you, you caused us to be born again to a living hope. We praise you, God, for your gracious and kind work, your mighty work. You took us from slavery and bondage to deliverance and freedom in Christ. We truly praise you. Please don't let us forget what you've done for us, Lord how you have transformed us. Father, we thank you that you, even since that moment of conversion, you've not left us the same. We're not immature babes in Christ, making the same mess as we once did. But by your grace, you, he who began a good work in us, he is bringing it to completion. 
and you are making us more like the image of your beloved Son. How good it is, Lord, to walk with you. How good it is to walk in your ways. Thank you. Father, keep making us like Christ. Even in our time together tonight and tomorrow, make us more like Christ. We believe that would be, that would be to your glory, and actually it would be for our good. So God, keep doing that good work in us, even as you have promised to do it. And Lord, one of the ways that you conform us to Christ, one of the ways you make us like your son, is you, you teach us how to make disciples. You teach us how to live on mission, how to take the hope of Jesus to those who are hopeless and lost in their sins. And so God, I pray my burden is that you would use this time just to, just to move us just even one decimal point, just a little bit, move us towards the lost for the name of Christ. May we, may we have greater zeal and greater conviction and greater strength to go towards those who need you. And Lord, we thank you that that even as we pray this, you've promised to hear this prayer because we're asking according to your will because we know that it's your will that we would declare the gospel. That's a prayer that we can pray with confidence in the will of God, that we would be faithful ministers of reconciliation, faithful ambassadors for the cross. And so God, would you be gracious to us right now? I know it's been a long day. I know we're probably tired. Would you just give us strength and joy to hear from you right now. And would you meet with us as we open your book? And in Christ's name, amen. All right. It's good to pray, isn't it? It's good to cry out to God together. We believe in a God who answers prayer. Um, you might notice if you have notes um, and you're taking notes that the title for tonight doesn't match. That's my fault. Not, not anybody's here. Um, as I've just been wrestling with the Lord and organizing thoughts, I kind of shifted directions a little bit, and, uh, and it'll all work together the same, um, but the title looks a little different. Simply put, church, we are hardwired by God to talk about that which we love. We're hardwired by God to talk about that which we love. And so we could read every book on evangelism. We could listen to every evan or, uh, apologetic um, podcast on evangelism, and at the end of the day, if we don't love Jesus, we'll never talk about him. Because he's going to be an intellectual exercise at best. And so tonight, I just, I'm compelled, I believe, to begin here. Missional living is the result of actually loving Jesus. If we're going to live on mission for Jesus, it's going to begin with actually loving Jesus. And I know that sounds like rocket science. I mean, anybody here love missionary biographies? I mean, okay, I mean, they're classics, you know, if you, if you haven't read one, you should. But they all kind of have a, sim a similar premise. Somebody loved Jesus. They didn't love eating bugs. They loved Jesus. They actually wanted Jesus to be made known everywhere because they loved him. And they're willing to sacrifice everything because they loved him. And so tonight, I just want to press this home by God's grace through his word. And that we'd really come away with this, all right, where's my love for Christ? How am I doing with my love for Christ? Again, we're hardwired by God to talk about what we love. So, for instance, tomorrow, there's a football game at 12 p.m. In case you didn't know the time, that's the time. Sunday. Sorry, it's Sunday. That's true. Thank you. Somebody knew I was wrong. <laughs> and so some of you are going to come to church at the first service Sunday, so you're free second service. Because <laughs> there's something you love going on during that time. And if that's what you love, then you've probably made plans for that event. You've had conversations about that event because it's, it's that which you love. You didn't have to put a, a note on your calendar. Hey, remind me, don't forget to watch the game. It's already there. You don't have to be reminded. It's what you love. We all have strange loves, don't we? I mean, let's just be honest. We have, we're, everybody's, uh, what, what, what one of my friends would say, we're all quirky. We're just okay with our own quirkiness. So when, when um, your pastor reached out to me and said, hey, would you come speak? I, I, I had a selfish motivation. Um, you see, I'm one of those guys who loves wearing spandex and riding my bike for long distances. 
And whenever I can have an excuse to ride Mount Diablo, I take it. Now, I didn't do it today, um, but actually that was on my heart and on my head, and I, I ran out of time. But when I come down to East Bay, I'm like, ooh, do I have time to just go park? I mean, I have a spot I park at. I know where to go. I know how far it takes from my doorstep to that spot, how long I can ride the mountain and come back down. And I was like, oh, I don't have the time. I know, I'm the guy that annoys you when you drive by and you're like, scoot over. That's okay. Um, don't judge me, all right? Um, my point is we all have passions. We all have things we love. And these things that we love, they naturally come out of us. They just naturally flow, whether it's your family, your job, your, your, your strange hobbies. Whatever consumes our affections, it's what comes out of us. It, these things that consume or possess the real estate of our hearts, you can't hide it. It's just what flows from you. And I, I believe that's actually how God made us. We can't separate what we love versus what we express or we talk about. And so the point is very simple tonight. If we truly love Christ, we're going to want to talk about him. If Jesus is more than a weekend thing to you, we'll talk about him. If Jesus is more than fire insurance, we're going to talk about him. If Jesus is more than religion, we're going to talk about him. And so I actually think that's one of the reasons we open our Bibles. We're so committed to this book where we do it in private, we do it in public. It's to warm our affections to Jesus. It's to, to cause our flame for Christ to increase. We need to remember and rehearse gospel truths on a regular basis. I think it was Martin Lloyd-Jones who coined the phrase, preach the gospel to yourself. We got to always be reminding ourselves of this gospel because our affections towards Christ grow cold, don't they? I actually believe this is a ploy of Satan, all right? There's a real devil, correct? There's a real devil. And a ploy of the real devil, and I would include the world, the flesh, and the devil in this, is always fighting to diminish our affections towards Christ. Always. When you become a Christian, Satan doesn't roll over and play dead. You're now enemy number one. And he's going to come after you, and his primary goal is just that your love for Christ would diminish. That your love for Christ would be so pathetic, you would never do anything with it. And if that's the case, you're getting heaven, but you, he's rendered you impotent for the kingdom of God. And you ain't taking anybody with you. And so what we need is a steady diet of gospel grace and gospel goodness and gospel glory. It's like pouring gasoline on the fire of our affections for Christ. And that's what, he, that's what God's desires for us, for all of us is. That we would be regularly pouring gasoline on this fire to be ever increasing in love for Jesus. Because as we love him, we'll live for him. As we live for him, we'll speak of him. I mean, saints, have you ever noticed how in your life you can pursue so many things that don't matter? But when you actually try to get alone with God, your brain's like zing, zing. Everything, everything that doesn't matter in the world is coming after you. Did you ever notice that? I actually think that's, if, 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 if there's spiritual warfare in the world, I'm like, that's right there at the top of the list. Because Satan doesn't want you in your Bible. He doesn't, want you, he doesn't want your affections warm towards God. He doesn't want you to love him more. So you pull out your, you pull out your Bible and your phone goes bananas, right? Or something, you're like, oh, I got to go do this. And so what, we need to be people who are coming back constantly and saying, I want my affections warm to Christ. You know, I know one of the ways that I can, I can fail at this is I can lean back on past affections for Christ. I can lean back on past knowledge of Christ. Are you guilty of that? Oh, I know that. I've studied that before. And yet that logic doesn't really work. I mean, how would it work if I told my wife, hey, babe, we're done talking. I've talked to you for 15 years, actually 20 years. We're done talking. I know you well enough. We've had that conversation before. We don't need to do it again. Yeah, that wouldn't go over well. Like, you've got to constantly cultivate this thing called marriage, right? And if, you know, my wife and I will get busy in life and we'll have a talk like this, you know, we've been a little bit, we were a little bit busy lately and, and we're co-inhabitating, but we're not doing well on the whole married thing. We just set aside time to, hey, how are you doing, right? And not just run by each other. And I think, honestly, we do that with Christ. We run by Christ. Oh, yeah, I know Christ. We're on a first name basis but you're not cultivating a heart for Christ and your affections begin to decrease and diminish. And so what I want to do right now, I honestly, I have a very simple goal that our, all of our affections for Christ would just increase. You just go, oh yeah, all right. 
Yeah, my affections are back where they need to be. Jonathan Edwards was right when he wrote Religious Affections, that our affections are actually designed by God to be warm towards Him. The problem is we love so many other things, right? But we should have hearts that love Christ. So that's where we're going to start, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at three stories. Actually, we're going to look at the end of three stories, all right? We're not going to do the whole thing. So if you want, I'm sure as Pastor Tony preached through the Gospel of John, he's had to. Great. Go listen to all of his sermons, all right? This is not an exegesis of all of John. I'm just going to pick points from John's gospel, okay? Um, And that's all we're going to have time for in the next 24 hours. Um, But we're going to just pick three examples in John's gospel. We're going to look at the end of stories, if you will, at least for tonight, of these people who had divine appointments with Jesus and how they responded. So the first one we're going to look at is a licentious sinner that had nothing to hide. This is in John 4, all right? So if you want to, if you're turning your Bible, you can go there. If not, I'll read it for you. Um, We're still under this. There's just one main point today, one or tonight. This missional living is a result of actually loving Jesus. And so we're just looking at three characters that I believe show love for Christ. And they lived on mission because of it, all right? That's what we're going to try to, I'm going to hope to show you from the Word of God. So John chapter 4. John 4, a famous, wonderful story, the woman at the well. We're going to talk more about this tomorrow, actually. But right now, we're just going to look at the end of the story. So without stealing too much thunder from what I want to say tomorrow, this woman is a societal outcast. You may know that. She's been sinned against, and man, she has sinned. Um, Her sexual immorality was known to all. Maybe it was even just the condescending glances she would get when she walked down the street, the gossip in the alleyway, but her sin was known. But like sinners do, you can guarantee that she'd become a professional hider of her sin. And if we, we should, we'll, we'll look at that more tomorrow, but if you remember the conversation with Jesus, when Jesus confronts her sin, <laughs> she ducks and dodges because she's not owning the reality of her sinfulness. And if we're honest, it's what we do today. When we're living in sin, we don't broadcast it from the rooftops. We become slick practitioners of hiding our sin. We duck and dodge this, just like this woman did. Sometimes we relabel sin or we, we compartmentalize sin. We even try to call unrighteousness righteousness sometimes in our day and age. But no one is fooled, not even ourselves, especially God. We're just hiding in our sin. So in John 4, Jesus interacts with this woman And if you remember the story, he offers her this living water. She doesn't know what to do with that. He confronts her sin of her marriages five times, living with men, not her husband. And this woman in verse 28, she leaves her water jar and he goes back into the town. And what I call this is I call this gospel transformation. You see, at this moment, I believe Christ has burst onto the scene of this woman's soul. And in that moment, she knows immediately there's no condemnation in Christ. No condemnation. Some of the best words in the Bible, no condemnation. And so she knows from the very get-go that Jesus bore her condemnation. And since Jesus took that condemnation, she had nothing to hide. So she has this one glorious aim. She wants Jesus to be magnified. She wants Jesus to be adored. She wants more to come to know the reality of no condemnation. I mean, goodness gracious, if I'm not condemned, nobody else in town will be condemned either. And out of sheer love for Christ, amazement at Christ, she proclaims, John 4, 29, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ or the Messiah? I love what these verses, like, just, you know, we read them and they're, they're interesting, but just think what the people in town are thinking. Wow, <laughs> he told you? All you ever have done, (laughs) he must be impressive because they know who she is. I mean, this vile, wicked woman, what? He knows your story? He knows all the mess you've done? Oh, and he still talked to you, by the way? Wow. So this woman went from ducking and dodging, avoiding people in town, to going straight into the center of town and declaring for all to hear, hey, you've got to come see this man who told me all that I ever did. Can this actually be the Christ? You see, maybe maybe for you it sounds, sounds, or maybe for us it sounds like this. I have got to tell you about Jesus. He knows everything I've ever done and he still loves me. 
He, he knows everything I ever will do, and he's forgiven me. Yeah. That's what she's saying. He, he knows everything. Oh, you've got to know him. You've got to know who he is. Because he's told me my life story, and he didn't condemn me for it. Because, see, that's what everybody in town did, right? They knew her story, <laughs> and they condemned her for it. Because that's what sinners do. We condemn each other. As long as, you know, we just judge each other, as long as we have the one up, then we're better. So they're all looking down their nose at this woman. And yet she explodes with nothing to hide. Brothers and sisters, when we know that we're not condemned by God in Christ, it should cause our affections to swell and say, oh, everybody else needs to know this, that you actually can live a life not being condemned, both now and for eternity. So do you see what love for Jesus did to this woman? It compelled her. I think of a geyser. You know, it's like it's bubbling under the surface, but at some point, it just has to explode. It has to just come right out. And so it explodes in John 4, 29. You've got to come and see. You've got to come and see what this man has done. You know, to use the words of Jesus, when, when you've been forgiven much, you love much. I'm going to put a, another phrase on here. This is not Jesus, but I think it fits. When you love much, you will speak of him much. Have you ever met somebody that has maybe, let's say, just got engaged? They're a little bit starstruck. My wife has this story that I didn't even get to witness. Um, the night we got engaged, um, it was Chicago. That's where I'm from. It was a blizzard. We got engaged outside because it was beautiful, but I almost froze to death. It's a terrible idea. Um, so we go to, we go into this Starbucks to get w- coffee and warm up and use the bathroom. So I go to the bathroom and I come out and uh, she's just like arrested this barista and just like told him the entire story of how she got engaged and he didn't care at all. <laughs> he was like, yeah, whatever lady, like just take it and go. She didn't care. She, she, for some reason she loved much. So she just is going to tell everybody the story. And it pales in comparison to the reality. You're no longer condemned by the God of heaven. So, so your natural response is, oh my goodness, I love him. And I want more to know him. And what's amazing is, is this woman, and I love, because church, this is what encourages me. And we're going to talk a lot about this. One of the lies that we begin to believe when it comes to mission is, I just don't know enough. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get asked a question, and then I'm going to sound like an idiot, so I'm just not going to open my mouth at all. This woman knows nothing. I mean, she literally says, can he be the Christ? She's not even fully confident yet of who he is, but he's something special, and I'm going to tell you about him. She just opens her mouth in love for Jesus. There's no slick technique. There's no, there's no evangelistic method she's following It's just, you got to come and check this guy out. He's told me everything that I've ever done. He knows me completely, and he still loves me. And then you look at the response in John 4, 39, and this is what I love. John 4, 39, many Samaritans from town believed in him because of the women's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So right there, you've got Samaritans, these half-breeds that Jews are supposed to hate, and they hate the Jews, and and all of a sudden, they're like, many of them are believing just because of this woman's story. They're, it's good enough for them. So then the Samaritans come to him, Christ. They ask him to stay with them, and he stays with them two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we've heard up for ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. So now they know him to be He's the Messiah, but they know him now as the Savior. So it's like, praise God, this woman opened her mouth. She, she just had holy boldness because of an absolute love for Christ. I don't care what you think, I'm going to tell you about him. And what happens? They come to know him, and they know that he is, he is actually their Savior. And so I think here, this licentious sinner that has nothing to hide is just this powerful witness for Christ. She loves him. She knows she's been forgiven. She knows she's not condemned. And brothers and sisters, frankly, I think sometimes the longer we get in the faith, we forget that simple, glorious reality. We're not condemned. We're not condemned. No condemnation in Christ. And we can take that and shout it from the rooftops. We can tell our neighbors, so why are you a Christian? Because I'm not condemned. 
because God's forgiven me of my sins. He knows everything about me and he still forgives me. And we just lift that up. We're not condemned. So we find ourselves identifying with this woman. We don't condemn her with her townspeople. We actually find ourselves like, yeah, I identify, I identify with that. Oh, my, my story is different than hers, but I deserve condemnation. It's not what he gave me. He's told me, he knows everything about me, and yet he still loves me. So that's the first example of someone who, has, who loves Christ and speaks of him. The second one, though, is in John chapter 9. And here we're going to see the end of the story of a man who was born blind. I call this one the suffering sinner with nothing but joy. He's a suffering sinner but with nothing but joy. And again, I'll cover more of this story tomorrow um, as we look at kind of examples of how Jesus shared the gospel. But right now we're just looking at the very end of it. In, in, John, in John 9, I've grown to love this story uh, because it's a story of a man born in suffering. A man, a man literally born in suffering. And I believe we see a Savior who's close to the brokenhearted. A Savior who is going after the sufferer. And actually, as a, a totally off topic, I think this is actually one of the po- most powerful ways to talk about our faith. Excuse me, because so often when it comes to religion and faith, we, we, it's all happy-go-lucky. It's just like, you know, it's a good party. It's a good show. We all want to be, it's very, it's always joyful. It's always almost kind of fakish. So, you know, actually, our Savior goes after the very, very broken. And he cares deeply for them at the level of their brokenness. And so here we find Christ healing a man who's been born blind from birth. This man's been a societal outcast due to his disability. If you remember, who sinned, this one or his parents? Somebody had to do wrong for this man to end up this way. So they think he's being judged by God, or at least his family's being judged by God for his blindness. This man is a man of shame and of ill repute. And then Jesus heals him. And by the end of the story in John 9, Jesus saves him. But what's crazy is once Christ heals him of his blindness, he's immediately thrust into what I'm going to call enemy territory. Instead of being received with excitement and wonder, he's on trial. Not only do these religious leaders hate Jesus, but man, Jesus had the audacity to perform miracles on the what? On the Sabbath. So, I mean, oh my goodness. There's no way we can celebrate this action. So he's in a hostile crowd, in hostile territory. They're grilling him over and over and over again. But listen to how this man responds to this less than sympathetic crowd in John 9, verse 24 through 27. So for the second time, they called a man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God, which is a great sarcastic jibe. Like, they're, they're, they're trying to act like they're giving glory to God when they only care about the glory of themselves. Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, well, whether he is a sinner, I don't know. But one thing I do know, <laughs> that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? I mean, did you hear this? He knows one thing. I was blind. Now I see. It's all I got for you. That's it. There's no great sermon, no great marketing technique, no package on it. Just I was blind. And now I see. And so for this man, his, his blindness was physical and spiritual. That's where at the end of John 9, Jesus, he calls him into spiritual light. But as you can always expect from Jesus, right, he's using this man's physical blindness to expose the reality of spiritual blindness in all people. And in the context, he's especially exposing the spiritual blindness of the religious leaders of the Jews. But with great joy and great exaltation, this man simply declares, I was blind, but now I see. See, similarly to the woman at the well, he's still fuzzy on who Jesus is. He's, he's not really, he's like, I don't even know who that guy's name was. How do he do it? I've already told you. But he knows Jesus has done something mighty on his behalf. You see, this is what love does. It causes you to speak out with joy and boldness. You may not have all your details in order, but love gushes out of you. 
I, I, I almost hate to bring this up because I think it's a false dichotomy. But sometimes when people become believers for the first time, they have just this absolute sheer joy in Christ. And they want everybody else to know. And the reason I don't like bringing that up is I actually think that's how we all should be all the time. We, we shouldn't lose that. It's a shame when people think that, well, when you mature in Christ, you'll chill out. I don't think that was Jesus' model. I think that's our carnal man setting in. But I think, I think what's beautiful here is that when you, when you love Christ and you know what he's done for you, you don't have to have all your ducks in a row. Now, we're going to talk about gospel content tomorrow. We should proclaim a biblical gospel, all right? But sometimes I think we get hamstrung by the, oh, I don't have all the right answers. When maybe you just opened your mouth and it was like, I don't know what, but I know he saved me. He, he redeemed me. He forgave me. He opened my blinded eyes. I can now see my sin and see the glory of Christ. He saved me. That's a great way to just share the gospel. You know, I love, I love stories. Um, I've heard them time and time again of evangelism gone wrong and God using it to save. <laughs> you may have your own. Where it's like, that was the absolute worst gospel presentation in the history of the world. And yet that person's on their knees repenting. <laughs> and then it just shows the power is not in our presentation. The power is God's. Amen. So we may just be like, oh, Lord, I just laid an egg. And they got saved? God, what happened? And it's like, yep, that's my power. You thought it was your presentation? That's not how it goes. Right. You see, there's, there's babes, just children who give just, I don't know, I just, I know that Jesus loves me. That's it. And maybe that's all that God needs for that person to say. But don't, did you notice where this man goes? It's just, it's, this is classic. It's almost humorous. Do you also want to become his disciples? I don't think this man is being a jerk. I think he's genuine. I think he's like, hello, he saved, he opened my eyes. Why would you not want to follow him? He's that great. This love is not shy. This love doesn't stop at intellectualism. When you know that Christ has opened your eyes, the depth of your love compels you to actually call others to respond to him. You know, I think often today, even amongst healthy churches, we've, we've imbibed our culture a little bit too much. So even if we share the gospel, we're a little bit shy of saying, so what are you going to do with it? Because that actually makes them say, I think you're an idiot. And you just burned a friendship. Or, or I'm not sure I'm ready for that yet. But that's actually, the gospel demands a response. So he's just saying, hey, what are you going to do? I mean, do you want to follow him too? This man, he, he, all he knew was he had a life of suffering, and now he has absolute joy in Christ, and he is, out of love for Christ, declaring to all, even the religious leaders who could kick him out of the synagogue, that's all good. Do you want to believe in him? Because he might be worth following. So we have this suffering sinner, nothing but joy in Christ. Well, as we just wrap it up here, we're going to look at a third person, and we're going to see a self-righteous sinner that sacrifices for Jesus. See, Jesus goes after all kinds of peoples. There's not one category that fits the bill. And this one we're going to find in John 19. In John 19, verse 39, a self-righteous sinner. Remember, we're still looking at just this idea that missional living is the result of loving Christ. That's, that's all tonight is. If there's one thought that sticks between your ears, hold on to that one. Missional living is the result of loving Christ. All these are just little stories, little snippets of, I believe, people who loved Christ and they did something with it. This one looks a little different, but I hope, I hope it's clear. In John 3, we're going to look at that tomorrow, Jesus has a well-known interaction with a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus. There we go. If anyone was this moral, religious, devout, you might call him church-going in the modern vernacular, he's the guy. He epitomizes the self-righteousness of the Pharisees. I mean, after all, he's the leader of the Pharisees or one of the few leaders of the Pharisees. And in John 3, I don't know if you ever noticed this, Jesus declares the gospel to Nicodemus and the story never finishes. In verse 21, 22, it changes and it's like, what happened to Nicodemus? 
All, most of the other stories we get, the woman at the well, she responds. The, the, uh, the centurion, he responds in faith. Like we get a little bit of a, okay, there was resolution. Not this story. In John 7, Nicodemus pops back up again. And he's speaking in a way that might be favorable, favorable to Jesus, maybe. And he's criticized for it about this prophet from Nazareth. But it's still like, ah, what's actually going on in Nicodemus' heart? We're not sure what his, where his faith is at. But then in John 19, 30, 1939, we see Nicodemus for the final time in John's gospel. And this time, Jesus has died. And here's Nicodemus with 75 pounds of expensive spices and ointments for the body of Jesus. John 19, verse 39 says, Nicodemus also, who had earlier come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. And they take the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with spices as the burial custom of the Jews. And that's the last we hear of this guy. Here's what I think is going on. Jesus has been publicly and brutally killed for all to see by Nicodemus' friends. They're the Pharisees. They've led the charge to kill Jesus. No question about it. The Pharisees and Sadducees have led the charge. I mean, they hated, they hated each other, but they united on hating Jesus. To identify with Jesus at this point is really the kiss of death. I mean, the disciples have all fled. John's at the cross with the mom. I mean, it's like, it's a pretty slim pick at this point. Because really, to, to identify with Christ is the kiss of death. They've just brutally killed your Lord. What are they going to do to his followers? And here we see Nicodemus, this man who was absorbed in his own self-righteous religiosity, sacrificing greatly for Christ, giving that which was costly for the sake of Christ. Now, I know I'm reading into this a little bit, but I think Nicodemus is believing in Christ. Because everybody else is running from the Messiah. Everybody else is killing the Messiah. Nicodemus is coming to the, to the burial ground of the Messiah with Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, and they are wrapping the body of Christ. And I'm kind of thinking to myself, you're only going to do that if you love Christ. There's going to be no, uh-uh, we are distant. That guy, the one they just hung on the cross, now we're, we're going to remove ourselves from him. I might be a follower, but I'm be a closet follower. Not Nicodemus. These spices weren't just costly. The very act of identifying with Jesus comes, I believe, it comes from a heart that's been transformed by the gospel. And it's this love for Christ that compels Nicodemus to costly sacrifice and costly identity with Jesus. That's all we get. And the story's over on Nicodemus. But Nicodemus, as we're going to see tomorrow, he got the most clear gospel presentation of anybody in the entire book of John. The most famous verse in the Bible was given to Nicodemus. God's word doesn't return void. I think, I think Jesus is hammering away at Nicodemus. John 7 shows it. Nicodemus is starting to be sympathetic to Jesus a little bit. And by the end of the book, Nicodemus is there burying the Messiah at great personal cost to both, I believe, probably his job security and maybe even his physical health. But love for Christ, it compels him to go and sacrifice for his Savior. Brothers and sisters, missional living is the result of loving Jesus. Each of these individuals loved Christ to the degree they were willing to speak and act in a way that displayed that love. And so here we just got to turn it to our own hearts for a few moments and we'll wrap it up. What do you love? Now, I'm going to assume you're here on a Friday night that there is, at some measure in your soul, a genuine love for Christ. All right? Uh, I'm not going to be harsh in that judgment on you. Obviously, only God knows our hearts. But I would say that there's a genuine, well, I love, I love Christ. But let's just, let's just put that aside. Put that aside and just think very practically, maybe not spiritual. But what do you love? That's a great question for us to do some work in. What excites you? What gets you going? What do you daydream about? What do you wish you had more of? Ready for it? What do you get angry when you don't get? It's a great way to know what you love, by the way. So the reason it's good for us to ask these questions is that I think sometimes what happens is that it reveals maybe there's something I love more than Christ. 
And so therefore, I don't speak about Christ because there's actually something that I love more than Christ. And if I speak about Christ, I'll have to give that up. You follow with that? All right. So there's a little book going to be available tomorrow. All right. It's called Honest Evangelism. I almost just decided to read the book out loud and call it a conference. It's that good. I'm not kidding. It's small. You all could read it. All right? And I, and I mean it. You, you should get it. You will be whooped in a good way by this book. God will do some serious soul work. It is the li- best little book I have ever read on how to share my faith. It's not a plan. It's not a five steps. It, it's honest. Yeah, honest evangelism, the title. It's honest. He owns, this guy, th- th- he owns like, you've got to, he calls it, you've got to get past the pain point. We're going to talk about that. It's hard to share your faith. Because you're going to lose something. But he makes some brilliant points. I'm going to read a few things just to highlight some of the things that God has stirred my soul in. So, so far as long as Jesus is not my greatest love, I will keep quiet about him in order to serve my greatest love. And he calls that greatest love my idol. I will keep quiet about Christ because I'm afraid of losing my greatest love, my idol. I will suppress the truth about Christ, or or suppressing the truth about Christ is the effect of our wicked worship of created things, and it actually makes God angry. And he makes a great case here in in the third or fourth chapter that we, have a, we all love something most. Maybe you loved your comfort most. I, I mean, I gotta be honest, I love comfort. How about you? I love it. Maybe you love your job most. Maybe you love family most. I mean, he tells a story here of breaking down in tears at the funeral of a family member because he loved the approval of his family more than telling them about Jesus. And they passed into eternity, didn't know Christ. And he had to wrestle with that. He talks about, I love my job and my career and my promotion more than telling my boss about Christ. Because if I open my mouth, I may not get that job. Or maybe I just love comfort and I don't want, I don't want the discomfort of my neighbors knowing that I'm the crazy Christian. And so I'm not going to talk to my neighbors because right now things are good. But if I open my mouth, it's not going to be good. And I'm going to lose comfort. Are you convicted yet? Because I am. And that's the point. When we love Christ most, we talk about him. And so I believe what God is after is stirring our affections, brothers and sisters. He's after stirring our affections. As we remind our souls of the gospel, we remind ourselves of things like no condemnation. He's opened my eyes that I might see. I am forgiven. I am loved by the God of heaven. I'm declared righteous in Christ. We remind ourselves and rehearse for ourselves gospel realities. We gaze upon the glory of Christ continually. And as we do this, the Lord's stoking our fire. He's building our affections back up. It's like, okay, Lord, my affections for you. I actually want to speak of you. And so we're going to finish tonight and just one more time. We're just going to pray. We're going to pray that God would cause maybe this campfire-sized affection for him to turn into a forest fire that our affection would grow. Because again, I believe that all of us, if you know Jesus, there's affection for Christ. Maybe it's just not what it should be. And so God wants to increase our affections. And then speaking of him, yeah, it's still going to be hard. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. But you're going to actually want to do it because your affections are for Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, forgive me. And I believe I could pray for my brothers and sisters here. Forgive us for lacking in affections for you as we ought. Well, we do love you. I believe that. We do love you. We just don't love you as we should yet. And honestly, that's going to be the fight this side of heaven. We're going to always be fighting our flesh. Other things are going to creep in, and we're going to need to learn to love you better and more. And as we love you, I I believe that you're going to chisel away the dross and the sin that's within us. And so, Lord, as we think about living on mission, I believe it all goes back to this, our love for Christ.
And so, Lord, if we've been loving other things, help us to repent of that. That's what the gospel's for. We can run to you and you don't condemn us. If we need to rehearse the gospel more so that our, the fuel of our affection is stirred, then so be it. But God, would you do a good and mighty work of increasing our affections for Christ so that we actually want to speak of him. That speaking of Christ is not a duty, it's not a drudgery, it's not a checkbox, it's not a mandate, it's a joy because he is our chief love. Would you please do this, God, in each one of us? That would be good for our souls and for your glory in our lives and then through us as we open our mouths and speak of Christ, our chief love. And in Christ's name, amen.